So we begin with the first one of these strange sounding true facts. And that is that in the original teachings of Islam, the story of Prophet Ibrahim salam and his son was very different from what we have been taught today by all these various sects. Whether you are Salafi, Sufi, Shia, or, any, or, or pretty much any other sect, you have already heard the same exact story. In fact, I think literally every single sect believes the same story, including Christians and Jews. I haven't seen any sect of Islam that interprets this story in a completely different way. The story we have all heard is that Prophet Ibrahim salam, or Abraham, peace be upon him, was ordered by God to slaughter his own son. Despite loving his son and feeling bad in his heart, the Prophet de decided to do it due to his absolute obedience to God. But when he tried to behead his own son, he found out that the knife wouldn't cut his neck. And then God told him, that he had passed the test and proven that he would do anything for God, whether it is good or bad. And then he was given, he, then he was uh, told to slaughter a ram instead. This long introduction to this video was to open your mind to the possibility that what you've been taught about this story may not be true at all. I'm here to tell you that the version of this story in the Quran is very different from the version we've been taught and that we have actually been taught the Jewish version of this story and in fact the moral of the story is completely different and in fact the exact is the exact opposite now some people might say why should we believe you well I'm not telling you to follow me blindly listen to what I have to say and after gaining knowledge follow what I say or refute me with your own knowledge. You see, you're not supposed to follow anyone without knowledge. In fact, the main argument these groups use to promote taqlid or blind following is that they say taqlid is necessary for those who don't have knowledge. So since you don't have knowledge, you must blindly follow someone else who does or who claims to. Well, let's compare their argument with what the Quran says. Auzu billahi min shaitan rajim and don't follow that which you have no knowledge of. Do you see how clear it is that taqlid is against Islam? This should tell you how fake all these groups who promote taqlid are. So don't blindly follow their version of Ibrahim salam's story. However, I'm not blaming every person who has taught you this story because this is the only story I could find in the Hadith. There are some contradictions and variations in the Hadith. For example, some Hadiths say that Ibrahim salam was ordered to behead his son Ismail or Ishmael, peace be upon him. But other versions say that it was actually Isaac or Ishaq, peace be upon him. However, in all these different versions, the moral of the story is always the same as the version found in the Jewish books in the Old Testament and in the Zohar, volume 5 of the Zohar. The moral of the story is that you must obey God just because he is God, not because he is good. You see, the moral of this story is in clear contradiction to true morality taught by the Quran and the original Sunnah. For example, listen to this hadith. Virtue is what eases the soul and reassures the heart, and vice is that which doesn't ease the soul nor does it reassure the heart, even if you are given fatwas by scholars to the contrary. Seek judgment from your heart, even if you are given fatwas by scholars to the contrary. If something rankles in your heart, keep away from it. So 
why is the moral of this story the opposite? And it's basically saying that we must do everything we are ordered to do, even if it feels wrong in our heart. Well, let's now compare the teachings of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, with the teachings of Judaism. Here are some quotes from Jewish books. He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. His heart rages against his Lord. Don't follow after your own heart. The heart is deceitful above all things. Of course, there are also passages in both the Old Testament and the New Testament that contradict these verses. But my point is that the belief that we must go against our own heart originates from Jewish sources and contradicts the Qur'an and Sunnah. The Qur'an says, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajim, Allah has endeared to you the faith and has made it pleasing in your hearts. So why do all the stories in the Hadith books that we know of contradict the message of the Qur'an and Sunnah regarding, the, regarding following our own heart and keeping away from things that feel bad in our heart? Why do all the stories about Ibrahim السلام, that we've been given by various sects have the same message? Just do what you're told. Well, let me quickly point out the fact that the Abbasids came to power over a hundred years after the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and they destroyed all other hadith and history books before them, and they then hired historians to rewrite the entire history of Islam. This is why all the hadith and history books that we have today were written after the Abbasid revolution and we don't have any books from the time of the Sahaba or even the Umayyads. And for example, the hadith book that Omar ibn Abdul Aziz wrote, which used to be quite famous and is said to have had 500 narrations no longer exists and neither do the history books of Saif ibn Umar rahimahullah, who wrote his book shortly before the Abbasids came to power. Even Kitab al-Athar which is the oldest hadith book that exists today wasn't written by Imam Abu Hanifa but was written by his student Shaybani who joined the Abbasid kingdom and was hired by them as a judge, even though Abu Hanifa himself was imprisoned and tortured to death by the Abbasid kings. In fact, Yunus ibn Ubaid, who was one of the students of the Sahaba, who lived during the Abbasid revolution, said that the Sunnah was disappearing even during the early period of the Abbasid movement. He said, there is nothing rarer than the Sunnah and the one who knows it, the real Sunnah in its original form, is even rarer. There are similar quotes from other students of the Sahaba who lived during that period. Inshallah, we will go into more detail about the history of the Abbasids on another video, but to summarize, the Abbasids destroyed all previous books except the Qur'an. And the reason they didn't destroy the Qur'an was because many Muslims had memorized it and they had memorized it completely from beginning to end. And so it was impossible to destroy it. So instead they hired scholars to misinterpret the Qur'an and even wanted to force people to accept these interpretations and they used to imprison, torture and even kill people if they had a different interpretation. And this is what they did to Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, right at the beginning when they came to power. But because Abu Hanifa was very popular, they then created the so-called Hanafi Madhab in his name and they themselves all of a sudden converted and became Hanafis, even though they killed the person who had, whom they had named their mashab after. And yet you know, they preached the same ideology 
that they had before, but simply in the name of their enemy, Abu Hanifa. And this is why Abu Hanifa's students, like Shaibani, were forced to work for the Abbasids. And what was their agenda? Well, the Abbasids came to power with the help of the Shias, according to the history books of Saif ibn Omar, which were destroyed by the Abbasids, the Shia sect was founded by a Jewish man called Ibn Saba. This is mentioned by Imam Tabari, who was murdered by a crypto-Jewish Hanbali, who also had nothing to do with Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. And that sect of Hanbalis who attacked and killed Imam Tabari used to completely contradict Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal in almost every way. They even lived in Taqlid, just like the Shias. This is why all the tafsirs from the time of the Abbasids claim that the earth is flat, just like the Jewish scriptures. Even though, as I explained on my previous videos, the Quran actually says that the earth is round. Anyway, we will inshallah expose the Abbasids more later, but the point is that the Abbasids came to power with the help of the Jewish Shias, and so many of the Abbasids were crypto-Jews pretending to be Muslims, or were at least influenced by the crypto-Jewish Shia version of Islam, similar to the so-called Muslim Brotherhood today, who praised the Shia Khomeini and were influenced by his ideology and fatwas, and they agreed with the Shias that Abu Bakr anhu, became the ruler for democracy, even though real Sunnis believe that Abu Bakr anhu, was appointed by the Prophet himself, as I've proven on my, on my previous videos. So this is the reason why many Jewish beliefs appeared in Islamic books, and much of the original teachings of Islam can now only be found today in the Quran, and not even in the Hadith. So what is the true story of Ibrahim and his son? Let's read the story from the Quran without any preconceived ideas and see what the Quran itself actually says. Let's read the perfect version of this story by reading the perfect words of Allah which have no substitute. And when he reached with him excursion, he said, My son, indeed, I have seen in a dream that I must sacrifice you. So what do you think? He said, O oh, my father, do as you are commanded. You will find, if Allah wills, you will find me, if Allah wills, of the steadfast. So Prophet Ibrahim salam, saw in a dream that he was slaughtering his own son. Does this prove that Allah had commanded him to slaughter his own son? Well, let's read the following hadith. The Prophet said, A good dream is from Allah, and a bad dream is from Satan. So whoever has seen in a dream something that he dislikes, then let him speak with, without saliva fries on his left and seek refuge with Allah from Satan, for it will not harm him, and Satan cannot appear in my ship. So bad dreams that are disliked by Muslims are obviously from Satan. So here's my question. Did the Prophet Ibrahim salam, enjoy having a dream where he slaughters his own son, or did he dislike it? Isn't the answer obvious? So if the dream was actually from Satan or Shaitan, doesn't that mean that Satan wanted him to slaughter his own son and not Allah? I'm sure many of you are totally surprised by this revelation, but if you think about it, it's the only logical conclusion. But there's even more proof. So let's continue reading the story from the Quran itself and see if this interpretation that I just gave makes sense. And then he reached with him the age of exertion. He said, O oh my son, indeed I have seen in a dream that I sacrifice you. 
So see what do you think? Why did he ask him what do you think? Doesn't this indicate that the prophet himself was suspicious of this dream? And that's why he consulted with his son about this? But then we read that his son, which some of the hadiths say was Isaac or Ishaq, and some say he was uh, Ishmael or Ismail, he agreed to being slaughtered. Now let's read another hadith which says, in, in Sahih Muslim, it says dreams are of three types, thoughts, fear instilled by Satan, and glad tidings from Allah. And uh, this was related by both Bukhari and Muslim. But then it says that the Prophet Ibrahim السلام, put his son down upon his forehead. The way this has been interpreted since the time of the Abbasids is that he put his head down in order to slaughter him. The question here is, if his son had agreed to be slaughtered, then why did the Prophet have to hold his head down like a sheep, like when you try to slaughter a sheep or lamb? I mean, the reason why people hold down animals to slaughter them is that the animal doesn't even know that it's going to be slaughtered and doesn't want to be slaughtered. So why would Ismail or Ishaq, who had agreed to be slaughtered, have to be held down by his father? Well, the answer is that the Quran doesn't say that his head was held down to be slaughtered. The words used in the Quran are that he put him down on his forehead. So what does that really mean? It means that he made him prostrate to Allah. Why? Well, let me, know, let, let, let me now tell you the real meaning of this beautiful story, which teaches true morality but has been distorted for so long. The real story is that Ibrahim, peace be upon him, saw in a dream that he was slaughtering his own son. He became suspicious of this dream, so he told his son about it and asked him what he thinks. His son thought that Allah had commanded the Prophet to slaughter him, and so he agreed to be slaughtered. Prophet Ibrahim peace be upon him, however, refused to believe that Allah would command him to do such a thing. This is because in Islam, we must always have a positive opinion of Allah. Jabir radiallahu anhu narrates that he heard the Prophet saying three days before his death, let none of you die without having a good opinion of Allah, the High and Mighty. So since the Prophet Ibrahim السلام, peace be upon him, had the best opinion of Allah, he rejected that Allah would command him to do such a thing. And he disagreed with his son's interpretation. And so he made his son repent for thinking that Allah wanted him to slaughter him. This is the reason why he held his forehead down. It wasn't to slaughter him, it was to make him repent because prostration is a form of repentance in Islam. And here's the proof from the Quran. Audu billahi min shaitan rajim and Dawood guessed that we have tried him and he sought forgiveness of his Lord and he fell down prostrate and turn to Allah in repentance. Likewise, Ibrahim السلام, held his son's forehead down in order to make him repent for having a bad opinion of Allah. In other words, for thinking that Allah would want an innocent person to be slaughtered or sacrificed. So his son realized his mistake and repented and he repented and by prostrating and by doing so submitted to Allah and Ibrahim held his forehead down 
to make him complete his repentance. You know, tell him that this is how you repent to Allah by prostrating. So he was teaching him how to repent. And he was making him repent for having a wrong opinion. Notice that there is absolutely no mention of Ibrahim alayhi salam trying to slaughter his son in the Quran. The story you are often told that the Prophet kept trying to cut his son's throat but the knife wouldn't work is nowhere in the Quran. It's nowhere in the Quran. If Allah's words are clear and complete as the Quran says, then why did Allah leave out the most important part of the story? The answer is because it's not a part of the story at all. This is the Jewish story that the scholars of the Abbasids tried to substitute the story of the Quran with, by claiming that this Jewish story was the interpretation of the Quran. So let's finish reading the actual story from the Quran itself. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajim And when they had both submitted and he put him down upon his forehead, we called to him, O Ibrahim, you have fulfilled the vision. Indeed, we thus reward the doers of good. Now this is the part that may seem to contradict everything I've said so far. Why did Allah say that the Prophet had fulfilled the vision? Well, to understand this part, you definitely need to read the ayah in Arabic, not in English. The word used here for vision is ru'ya. However, the word used earlier was manam. But if you read many English translations, you see that they translate both words as dream or both words as vision. And it seems like they're doing it on purpose to confuse us, because why would they translate both Arabic words as one English, with one English meaning? Notice that Allah didn't say to Ibrahim that you have fulfilled the, the dream or the manam, but rather he said that you have fulfilled the vision or the ru'ya. In some non-Arabic translations, you may find both words being translated as dream, but the truth is that the Quran uses two different words. And as I explained earlier, Allah doesn't use different words for no reason and just to be poetic. In Arabic, the word roya is only used for dreams or a vision from Allah. For example, uh, dreams from Rahman, true dreams, righteous dreams, good dreams, dreams of a believer. All of these are called ru'ya. However, bad dreams and satanic dreams uh, are called al-ahlam. For example, satanic dreams or biological dreams or meaningless dreams, the dreams of the nafs. So why did Allah use a different word here? It was indicated that Ibrahim salam had actually fulfilled a holy vision and not the satanic dream that he had seen. Also notice that it says you fulfilled the vision referring only to Ibrahim and not to his son because in Arabic you there's two different yous. There's a sing singular you and a double you. And there's a you for two people uh, which is uh, anta and there's antoma, but the, the Quran says that only Ibrahim, only he fulfilled the vision. It doesn't say that you too fulfilled the vision. If you read in Arabic, it says only you, only Ibrahim fulfilled the vision. You see, if uh, if you go by the uh, the version of the story that you all, all been taught since childhood, if both Ibrahim and his son had agreed to. Uh, to slaughter his son, then they had both fulfilled the dream, right? But the Quran says Sadakta, which means you fulfilled, not Sadaktoma. So it's saying that Ibrahim salam, was right and he had the right understanding and the right opinion of Allah. 
You see, the test was to show if the Prophet had the best possible opinion of Allah or not. It's actually a deeply moral and wonderful story. It is saying that you must avoid following orders blindly even if the order is attributed to God. If anyone still disagrees with me and thinks this story is what we've been taught you know, in the past, then let me ask you an important question. Why should Jews and Christians and people of other religions convert to Islam? What is your proof or argument against them and their religious books? Don't we often complain about the immoral statements in the Bible? For example, the Bible says that Jesus insulted a woman for no reason and called her a dog. We believe that Jesus or Isa would never have said such a thing. We Muslims would never uh, attribute such a thing to Jesus. And we want Christians to stop having bad opinions about God and Jesus. Yet we ourselves are taught that we must obey any command that's attributed to God without analysis or having any sense of morality. We are told that morality doesn't matter and that we must just obey our religion or our government. And this is what every sect teaches their own followers. Now some may say that this only applies to obeying human beings and doing taqlid. So some Muslims might agree with me and say that yes, taqlid is wrong and we shouldn't obey people when they tell us to do bad things. But we must always obey God. But my question is, how do we know what God wants us to do? Didn't the Prophet tell us to follow our heart and avoid doing things that feel bad in our heart? Don't we complain about the bad things in Jewish and Christian books? And don't we deny the possibility of God ever saying those bad things? For example, in the Jewish and Christian book such as uh, Isaiah, Samuel and Deuteronomy and others, God supposedly orders the killing of children and babies. Here's a clear example. Slay utterly both old and young, mates, little children and women. Is it not hypocrisy if we Muslims complain about the Jews and Christians believing in such things, yet we believe the same thing about God, that he sometimes may order us to do bad things and we must just obey blindly? You see, blind obedience is haram, even blindly following prophets. You see, because blind obedience is shirk. So it doesn't matter who you're following blindly. The practice of blind following is shirk. So if, uh, if it's worship to, follow a hum uh, to blindly follow a human being, then blindly following a prophet is also worship. Because there's no difference between worshiping a prophet and worshiping a statue. Worship is worship. Shirk is shirk. You know, it doesn't matter whether you worship a prophet or you worship a stone. Either way, you're worshipping, and worship is shirk either way. So if taqlid is shirk, blind obedience is shirk, then blind obedience is shirk if you do it from anyone. And the prophet himself told us to follow our own heart. The prophet himself told us this. And he told us that, we, that he came to remind us of this. This is why the Qur'an is also called dhikr, which means remembrance. We are supposed to recite the Qur'an in order to remember our fitra, to remember our hearts, so that we would stop blindly following governments or blindly following our local mosque or church or temple or synagogue, so that we would stop blindly following television and the news or evolutionist scientists and NASA and the Freemason Lodges and their Grand Masters who are running all these things. You see, we've been taught that Islam is a religion of pointless rituals, but in reality the original Islam or real Islam is the religion of morality, kind-heartedness, heroism, piety, 
love, romantic love, and nobility. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu said, by the one besides whom none is worthy of worship, the believer is not given anything good better than his good opinion of Allah. Ammar ibn Yusuf radiallahu anhu said, I saw Hassan ibn Saleh in a dream and I said, I was hoping to meet you. What can you inform us of? He, he, he replied, I give you the glad tidings that I see nothing better than to have good opinions of Allah. So like Ibrahim alayhi salam, we must pass the test by refusing to accept that Allah would command us to do bad things. And like his son, we must repent for having wrong opinions about Allah in the past and blindly accepting what we were taught about Allah by the Salafis, Sufis, Shias and other sects. If you're still not convinced, then my question is, if the Prophet Ibrahim salam, had agreed to slaughter his own son without his son having committed any crime, then why does Allah then end the story by saying, Audhu billahi min ash rajim Peace upon Ibrahim. Peace? Is this a statement about a man who is about to slaughter his own son? Does that make logical sense? No, the Quran is saying that he was a peaceful man who would never slaughter a child or an innocent person. Even if Satan tried to make him think that's what God wanted him to do. Audhu billahi min ash rajim Neither did we send an apostle or a prophet before you, but when he had an aspiration, Satan would throw something into his aspiration. But Allah abolishes that which Satan throws in. Then Allah makes precise his verses, and Allah is knowing and wise. And the Quran ends the story of Ibrahim, peace be upon him, with this verse. Audhu billahi min ash rajim and we blessed him and Isaac, but among their descendants are the doers of good and those who are clearly unjust to themselves. So after praising the Prophet Ibrahim salam, for being peaceful and saying peace be upon him and refusing to slaughter his own son, the Quran says that there will be those from his descendants who will be unjust to themselves in other words, there will be people who will have a negative opinion of Allah and will do bad things in the name of God. And this also connects to the issue of circumcision, which I will inshallah explain on another video. And finally, there is one more verse that is constantly misinterpreted by all modern day tafsirs. And it's the one about the magnificent slaughter. A'udhu billahi min ash rajim you have fulfilled the vision. Indeed, we thus reward the doers of good. Indeed, this was the clear trial, and we ransomed him with a magnificent slaughter. So what was this magnific magnificent slaughter? We've been told in the Ahadith that it was a ram, and according to the Bible, it was a lamb. So we are told that instead of slaughtering his own son, Ibrahim salam, was told to slaughter a ram or a lamb after his knife failed to cut off his son's neck. And this is the meaning of the magnificent slaughter that we've been given. But what is so magnificent about slaughtering a lamb or a ram? What's so special or great about it? The Arabic word used is al-adim, which means great or magnificent, or fantastic, sublime, terrific, and sensational. Does any of this apply to slaughtering a ram or a lamb? So is a lamb or a ram more sublime than Isaac and Ismail, Ishmael? Of course not. So what was the promise that was given to Ibrahim alayhi salam? Well, let's think about it. Because Allah tells us to think or ponder on the Quran. So we have to think about this. 
The correct understanding of the story is that Satan showed a dream to the prophet to make him slaughter his own innocent son. The prophet passed the test by having a good opinion of Allah and refusing to slaughter his own son. His son also eventually passed the test by repenting for thinking that Satan's aspiration is Allah's command, for confusing the two together. Then Allah promised Ibrahim السلام, that his son's slaughter will be ransomed by a magnificent or sensational slaughter instead. In other words, Satan himself will be slaughtered or beheaded for trying to trick the Prophet into slaughtering his own son. That's right, the devil who showed this dream to the Prophet will be slaughtered for this crime in retaliation, for the tr crime of trying to make the Prophet slaughter his own son. I know all this sounds strange, but I'm not making it up. It is narrated in several narrations, both in Sunni and Shia books, that during the end of time, Satan will be beheaded. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim Iblis, or Satan, said, my Lord, give me respite till the day when they, are, when they are raised, the day of resurrection. Allah responded, So you are of those who are given respite, but instead until a day whose time is appointed. <laughs>